Good to be in church today. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. I'm beginning a series today simply titled, What the Future Holds. And we're going to be talking about prophecy. We're going to be talking about future events and, and things that are going on in our world today. And all that other good, fun stuff. What's that? My PowerPoint. Now, let me just say this about um, studying end times and, and prophecy. And um, number one, don't let it scare you. And again, so many times people get scared to death when they start thinking about end times prophecy and future events and, and what the future holds. And so it kind of just, it freaks them out and scares them. And so again, with that being said, guys, we should be encouraged as children of God, number one, to see what's going on in the world today. Now again, I know that sounds, I can't believe you're saying we should be encouraged by what's going on. Guys, all of this has to happen. And again, that's the reality. And again, when you study Scripture, you realize that, as Paul is going to say here in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, is verse number 1. Look what he says. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. So again, Paul is not sugarcoating anything. He's not saying that, um, you know, things are going to get better. And, and, and by the way, guys, can I just say this? Biblically, things are not going to get better here on earth. We won't see that here in just a minute. Now, for the child of God, is it going to get better for us eventually? Yes. Because anybody else, are you excited about heaven? And one day we'll be in the presence of Almighty God. But until then, we are here. And by the way, guys, I don't believe any of us are here at this appointed time by accident. I don't believe in coincidence. I don't believe in, you know, luck. I believe that God has put us here as the church, as the body, at this appointed time for a purpose verse number two he's going to give you some characteristic traits of what's going to be what's going to look like in the last days men will be lovers of their own selves we don't see that at all do we covetous people wanting what's not theirs we don't see that at all either do we boasters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents disobedient to parents disobedient to parents my bible says that like four times and i don't know what version you got but again we're seeing this all and again i just thought it was fascinating that of all the sins that paul could have listed he put this one in there as well and again if you go back to the original ten commandments what's part of the original ten commandments children do what honor your mother and father which, again, I always find fascinating that, again, killing, stealing, coveting, and then honoring mom and dad. Because, again, here, and guys, here's the reality. Because what do we tend to do many times as Christians? We put degrees on sin, do we not? Well, little Johnny just, just disrespected mom, but he's not killed anybody. Right? So we, we're justifying the sin which is, again, where we are in a culture today, we are justifying wrong behavior. Because, again, we justify it by calling it, well, it's their choice, it's, it's their body, and it's this, and it's that. And No, guys, it's sin. God calls it sin, so mark it down, it is sin. It is dishonoring God, it is, is falling short of the glory of God, and there's dire consequences for it. And again, us calling sin out doesn't mean that we don't love somebody or that we're hateful. It means that we love you enough to warn you, which again was part of the responsibility of the Old Testament prophets. It wasn't just to talk about the love of God, but it was also to preach the judgment of God. But again, unfortunately, the churches have gotten away from that. All we want to talk about and discuss is love, 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 love. Can I tell you this, guys? A lot of other religions are teaching the same exact thing. 
But with that, God loves us so much that, again, he sent his son to die in our place to become the penalty for our sin. Because, again, there's dire consequences for us falling short of the glory of God. You know what the dire consequence is? Eternity in hell. And you know why I warn people when I see them falling into sin? Because I don't want them to die separated from God in a place called hell. But then we get called hateful, and you're mean-spirited, and you're not Christ-like, and you're not like Jesus, and this, that, and the other. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my goodness. Paul couldn't live in this culture. None of the disciples could. How about John? Anybody heard the phrase, oh, generation of vipers anytime lately? Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. We hear that about the church. But Jesus was talking to religious people when he called them hypocrites. Guys, sin is still sin. And again, we, get, we can't sugarcoat it as a church. And like I said, when you study Old Testament prophecy, and, you, and again, you study the, those Old Testament prophets, guys, again, they didn't sugarcoat anything. They had to let people know. They had to warn. How about Noah? How long did Noah warn the people? Did Noah hate people at that time? No, he warned them because he loved them. And he warned him because God had given him a message to preach that, you know what, listen, pending judgment is coming. Guys, I have no idea when the rapture of the church is going to take place. I have no idea. And so, again, part of our responsibility as the church is to warn. Again, we know Jesus is coming back, amen? Is anybody confused with that? Is anybody excited the fact that we know that Jesus is coming at any moment? But with that being said, guys, we have a responsibility as the body of Christ to go forth and do what? To preach the gospel. Now, again, is, am I going to be popular because I preach against sin? No. Guess what? Some of you aren't going to like me when I preach against sin. Now, again, I don't want you going around thinking, man, Pastor Tim must be following me, watching my life, because everything he's talked about, I've done this week. No, that's called the Holy Spirit. Now, again, is your pastor perfect? Does your pastor have sin? Yes. No, I'm not perfect. I have sin. <laughs> Should have separated those two questions. We all battle it. But as children of God, aren't you thankful for the forgiveness of God today? Because, again, as a result of our forgiveness that we've received from Christ, and, again, the salvation, the eternal life that we have, guys, we're spared from the, from the wrath. Are we going to be persecuted? Yes, I believe that, and we're going to see this here in just a minute. Because as we keep reading, without natural affection, boy, we can park there, couldn't we? Truce breakers, man, we can park there. False accusers, we can park there. Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, boy, we can really park there. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. In verse number five, guys, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. We have a lot of that going on. And again, they had this form of godliness. And again, when you hear research and statistics, and, and again, I've, I've never believed any of the research and statistics when it comes to how many Christians live in the United States of America. It's always like 70, 75, 78% of people in the United States of, of America profess themselves to be Christians. And I'm thinking to myself, wow. 78% of Americans call themselves Christians, but yet we are an ungodly nation. We still kill more babies on, the, on this unborn children than, than any other nation on, on the planet. Without even batting an eye. We promote same-sex marriage without batting an eye. We're promoting this, this, this transgender movement, and, and we're, we're promoting, again, just all other sexual immorality, guys, but yet... 78% of Americans profess to be Christian. How do we define Christianity would be my question. 
because again now we've 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 put christians all in in a bowl you know we include muslims and and we include other world religions other world denominations guys can i identify to you today what a a a christian is and again when you study the book of acts a genuine christian is a sold out follower of jesus christ that is willing to pay the price to follow jesus that is willing to even become a martyr for jesus and again when you think about jesus and again he says take up your net you know again deny yourselves take up your cross and do what follow him we keep reading for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins led away with diverse lust ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth now as janus and jambres withstood moses so do these also of resist the truth men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith but they shall proceed no further for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs was also but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Can somebody say amen this morning? Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Pastor Tim, I do not want to suffer persecution. Here's what I've told people in the past. Well, just keep living the way you're living. Ouch. You don't want to suffer persecution? Just keep living the way you're living. Because again, who's, who are going to be the ones, according to the Apostle Paul here, that are going to suffer the persecution? Those who live what? godly not worldly church godly now again we don't like these verses do we why because again part of our, our, us following jesus is because we want to be like jesus listen we rejoice in the power of his resurrection but boy we don't like the fellowship of his sufferings man last sunday was awesome amen we celebrate the risen savior by the way he's still alive today amen and we rejoice in the power of the resurrection. But man, it's that fellowship of his sufferings. The afflictions and the tribulations and the persecutions. And I love how Paul reminded Timothy, and he's reminding us today, guys. Listen, even when you go through that, if you continue to live godly, guess what's going to happen? He will deliver us. And here's verse 13 circle this verse do whatever you need to do to get this into you but evil men and sedu and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived i love the fact that paul said listen you know my manner of doctrine you know what i believe is doctrine important church absolutely you know why doctrine is so important because it directs your behavior listen if i told you today that there were many paths to heaven you know what you would leave out here today no godly living and again but this is the teachings that we're hearing guys that there's many paths many directions to god there's not there's one and it's through Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, the Son of David, the Savior, the Messiah. The only way to be reconciled to God is through His Son. But again, this is what we're battling. And then I want you to look at verse 16 and 17. Because again, as we think about prophecy, guys, and again, because I've heard well-known pastors that have mentioned the Old Testament is no longer relevant to the church today does anybody else agree with me today that that's nonsense the new testament would make no sense without the old testament 
Amen? But look what he says. All Scripture. Everybody say the word all. All. That means Genesis 1-1 is just as inspired, is just as God breathed as Revelation 22. It's just as important. By the way, guys, is creation important? <laughs> Should we be fighting and defending for this battle of, against the, the, not, the people who don't believe in creation? Again, you haven't heard about evolution too much anymore, but guys, again, that's one of those false teachings that so many people have been become just trapped into. And again, it all boils down to why? Because they don't want to submit and succumb to a higher power. In the beginning, God created. Period. Settles it for me. I, I don't need to go any further. He created. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And then he goes on to say it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And then go to chapter 4, look at verse number 3. We're actually verse number 2, look what Paul says. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Hey, Pastor Tim, we want to hear what we want to hear today. I don't want to hear what God has to say. Guys, where are you going to benefit more from? What God has for us or what we have for one another? Do I like reading certain passages of Scripture that just convict me beyond... <laughs> beyond what I, can, what I can even think. But guys, those verses are there to help us. Not to discourage us, but to encourage us to godly living. Guys, here's why we should study prophecy. Number one, over one or about one-third of the, of the entire Word of God, again, the chapters of the Word of God are prophetic in nature. One-third. And again, when you study prophecy, you know what, what studying a prophecy should cause us to do as, as children of God? It should cause us to live godly, knowing that, again, one day that God is coming back. We don't know when, but it should cause us to live godly in this world. But again, we bought into the, to, to the lie of God. Pastor, it, it's just impossible to live godly in this, this, this godless culture. No, it's not. How many of you would think, that, do, do, you, do you agree that the Apostle Paul lived in some godless times? <laughs> yeah. But what did Paul do? He lived godly. Was he perfect? Absolutely not. He still had his sin issue. But listen to me, guys. He decided to live for Jesus. So again, as we think about prophecy. And again, as we think about, again, the, the, the times that, are, that have already, the things that have already happened, the prophecies that have already been fulfilled. And by the way, guys, there are still events biblically that have not yet been fulfilled that will be fulfilled. So again, let me just give you just some, some thoughts this morning as, as we think about prophecy. And, and again, I want to do this this morning because, again, I just want to give you an overall just a view of, of prophecy this morning biblically. And the reason why I want, to, I want you to see this today is this, guys. is Above everything else, I want you to know this. God's Word can be trusted. And then number two, if the prophecies that have already been prophesied have been fulfilled, you know what the good news is? <laughs> everything else that has not yet been fulfilled, because we do trust the Word of God, will be fulfilled. It's a promise. We don't have to walk around and say, man, I don't, I don't know if that's going to happen or if this is going to happen. No. If everything else that, that has already been prophesied has been fulfilled, you can mark it down. Everything yet unfulfilled will eventually be fulfilled. And we're going to start on those, those, those subjects next week. But again, just real quick this morning, guys. 
And again, if you guys need these verses, you know, just, just call me, whatever, and I'll be more than happy to give, give them to you. Now, again, the Lord Jesus Christ himself had been um, over 300 prophecies fulfilled just by him, Jesus himself. 300, just Jesus. Now, the day he died, over 30 different prophecies were fulfilled on the day that Christ died. Now, think about that, church. One day, and again, many, many scholars believe 33 different prophecies were fulfilled on the day Jesus died. So do you think prophecy is important? And again, here, here's what's so awesome, guys, is that everything written in the Old Testament was written hundreds of years before Jesus died. Why is that? Because again, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Here's the thing, guys. Holy men of God spake as they were what? Moved by the Holy Spirit. They were just putting to paper what God was telling them to write. We can trust the Word of God. 33 different prophecies. And listen to me, guys. Listen to these verses, guys. His betrayal was prophesied in Psalm 41 9. They, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Who betrayed Jesus? Judas Iscariot. Fulfilled in Mark 14, 10. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priest to betray him unto them. Now, I'm going to stop there just real quick. If that was the only prophecy fulfilled that day, it would have been good enough for me. But it wasn't. It wasn't the only one. But if it was, guys, it should be good enough for us. The price of his betrayal. How much money was given for his betrayal? 30 pieces of silver. Now, again, you say, where do we get that number from? Well, how about Zechariah? Chapter 11, verse number 12. I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. Matthew 26, 15, the fulfillment. And said unto them, what will you give me, and I will deliver them unto you. And they covenant with him 30 pieces of silver. Again, guys, fulfillment of prophecy what would be done with the money Zechariah eleven thirteen. 13 the Lord said unto me cast it unto the potter a goodly price that I was prized of them I t- <laughs> someone's got a bad connection out there get connected guys I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord fulfillment Matthew 27 5 through 7 he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple departed and went and hanged himself The chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury, because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and and bought with them the potter's field to to bury strangers in. How about Jesus being scourged? Isaiah 56, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Matthew 27, 26. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then verse number 30 in Matthew 27, they spit upon him, took the reed, and smote him on the head. Fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. His garments, and by the way, guys, you can read Psalm 22 and find all kind of fulfilled prophecies. Psalm twenty two eighteen. they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vestures. Fulfilled in John 19, 24, they said therefore among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Psalm twenty two sixteen, 16, his crucifixion. Is prophesied for dogs have compassed me the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me they pierced my hands and my feet John 19 16 then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified and they took Jesus and led him away guys even even the simple prophecy of and again you think about those those sayings of Jesus on the cross and, and again the the one saying where he says I thirst 
Do you realize I thirst is a fulfillment of prophecy? And again, listen to, to, to Psalm 69.3. I am weary of my crying, my throat is dried, mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. And in John 19, 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that his scripture might be fulfilled, he saith, I thirst. Can anybody tell me what the soldiers tried to give him to drink? Do you know that's even fulfilled? Do you know that's even talked about in the Old Testament? Aren't you glad that God is, is not a God of confusion? That he's very detailed? He's a detailed God. And again, even vinegar is mentioned. And again, here's what they would drink. They gave me gall, Psalm 69, 21. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. John 19, 29. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar. They filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. Being mocked by the people. Psalm 22, 7 through 8. And they that see me laugh me to scorn, they shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Fulfilled in Matthew 27, 40, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. And guys, what do we know about Jesus' bones being broken on the cross? Not even a bone of him would be broken. Prophesied in Exodus twelve forty six: In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. A detailed God. Genesis 3 tells us that he would be born the seed of a woman. And he would put enmity between who? All prophecy, guys. Micah 5, 2 even tells us the exact place he would be born. Bethlehem. Where do we know Jesus? Where was Jesus born, church? Are we getting it? Are, are we grasping it, guys? The Word of God is trustworthy. There's not... There's no lies in the Word of God. And listen, if God has promised something will come, something will come. If God has promised something's going to happen, guess what, church? You can take it to the bank that something is going to happen. And again, we have the precious promises of God's Word to remind us of this. Job tells us again, gives us the beauty of the resurrection predicted in Job 19, 23 through 27. In Job chapter 9, he talks about there's going to be a mediator between God and man. Fulfilled when Paul told young Timothy, there's going to be a mediator between God and man. And who is that man? Christ Jesus. Who is the go-between between sinful man and a holy God? Christ. Psalm 30, 34, 10, again, talks about the, the, not a bone of his will be broken. And again, we saw last week or two weeks ago the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, fulfilled in Zach, or fulfillment of uh, Zechariah 14, 4 prophecy. Isaiah 53, guys, he would be despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. It would also go on to say, by his stripes, we are what? We're healed. And again, guys, when we think about the, the, the gore and, and, and the, the bloodshed of the crucifixion, guys, again, Isaiah 53 reminds us prophesied hundreds of years before the, various, before the very crucifixion took place. But guys, as you read Isaiah 53, and then, and then as you look at the crucifixion, guys, again, you, you, you can't separate them. Again, because the Word of God is trustworthy. Now, there's going to be many things that have yet to be fulfilled that we're going to talk about in the coming weeks. How many of you have heard the phrase, the rapture? Right? Everybody heard it? Now again, the, the greatest argument against the rapture of the church is this. The word rapture is not mentioned in the Bible. 
How many of you believe in the Trinity? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, right? Now listen, y'all ready? This, this might mess you all, some of you up. The word Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible. But we believe in the Trinity, right? So again, we believe in the rapture. I believe, again, the rapture is a fulfillment that is yet to be, or a prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled. That is coming. And I cannot wait. <laughs> Amen? That should have woke a lot of you up this morning. We're going to be out of here. But again, the rapture is, is something that not not been fulfilled. Again, the judgment seat of Christ, the appearance of the false prophet and the Antichrist. Seven-year tribulation period, the rebuilding of the Jewish temple, the seal judgments, the ministry of the two witnesses, 144,000. Again, you see all this in the book of Revelation. Seven trumpet judgments, seven bowl judgments, the battle of Armageddon, the second coming of Christ, regathering of Israel, thousand-year millennial reign of Christ, the great white throne of judgment, and the new heaven and new earth. Can somebody get excited this morning? Because here's the reality, church. Those have yet to be fulfilled, but you mark it down, take it to the bank right now. Listen, if you're a betting man, take all you got and go bet. No, don't go bet. I'm just saying. These will happen. I promise you they're going to happen. And guys, here's the reality. What if the rapture of the church took place today? Would you be ready? Would you be ready? If you had to stand before God today, would you be ready? Could you say beyond a shadow of a doubt, yes, I'm prepared. Yes, I know if I die today, I know that I would go to heaven. Because guys, that's the most important thing I can encourage you with today. Is yeah, we know the rapture's coming, we know the second coming, we know the, the, the witnesses and the antichrist and false prophet and this that and the other and so many people believe that you know i'll just wait till the seven year tribulation period to give my life to christ and you now you know what the apostle paul said he said behold today is the accepted time behold today is the day of salvation now let me let me share this with you guys and i'm guys i'm almost done anybody familiar with the law of probability now, y'all ready for this, guys? And again, when we talk about fulfillment of prophecy and the law of probability, there was this mathematician, his name was Dr. Stoner, I believe it was. And so th there's, there's some prophecies, the Old Testament, about, and, and the prophecies are geared towards 10 particular cities of the Old Testament. Now, these cities are Samaria, Gaza, Ashkelon, Jericho, the Golden Gate in Jerusalem, the Plowing of Zion, the Enlargement of Jerusalem, Palestine, Moab, Ammon, Edom, and Babylon. Now, all of those had, had prophecies uh, against them. Now, let me try to explain the law of probability. Now, again, I know we're, we're in a Baptist church, and some people might freak out. Got a pastor's got a deck of cards in his hands. Right? How many, how many cards are in a deck of cards? 52. So, what is the probability of drawing just a random card? One out of what? 52. Okay. Now, we know there's hearts, diamonds, spades, and clubs, right? Ronica told me that. I, don't, I didn't know any of those. And here's something else we know. There's four of each card in a deck of cards, correct? Four aces, four kings, four queens, four jacks. You can go all the way down to, to two, the deuces. Twos, twos, not deuces. So, what's the probability of drawing an ace out of this deck of cards one in what no yeah wh wh who said that one out of 13 four out of 13 or four out of 52 which is one out of 13 because we have 13 different sets of cards right so again the probability is now one out of 13 so it goes from one out of 52 to one out of 13 now those 10 cities i just mentioned to you Again, the, this, this mathematician did this, this research. Again, I don't know how, how it's all done. But he said the probability of all of those prophecies against those ten, ten cities being fulfilled 
Y'all ready for this? I don't think you are, but I'm going to give it to you anyways. Was this. Here's the probability. 5.76 times 10 to the 59th power. This is the probability, according to worldly people, to mathematicians, to, to people who don't understand Scripture and, 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 again, how we can trust the Word of God. Anybody want to try to give me that number? Well, I already did it for you, so hold on. Yeah, there it is. Yes. And if you marked one of those coins and put a blind man in there, that's, that's, that's the illustration that's used. Now, can we trust the Word of God? Do we, do we truly believe today that everything that has already been prophesied up to this point has been fulfilled? I don't have to worry about future events being fulfilled and thinking about, okay, the chances of that being fulfilled is 576 followed by 59 zeros. No. I have a 100% guarantee that they'll be fulfilled. Now, I'm going to ask you this, and again, You don't have to answer. You can if you like. Because again, I want to try to show you and distinguish the difference between this Bible prophecy and because again, as we talked about today, in the end times, you're going to see all this mess. How many of you ever had your palm read? Right? Or, or again, you, you, you'll hear these things and pick a number between 1 and 10 and and it's a video. You're watching it on Facebook, and they'll tell you, you think about a card that's in this deck of cards, and I'm going to tell you what your card is. Or these people that try to predict the future. And by the way, guys, there's been people that have tried to predict the second coming of Christ for years. They've always, they, they are 100% wrong. Remember the year 2000? Anybody remember that? It's hard to believe it's been 21 years ago. World's coming to an end. All the computers are going to crash because, again, all the, it doesn't recognize the zero or the one or whatever. And I'm thinking to myself, you guys are so foolish. I never worried one time, guys, about the world coming to an end in, in the year 2000. And then you hear pastors that will justify the ending of the, the year 2000 by saying, you know what, it's been 2,000 years since Christ died and yeah, whatever. And I'm like, no. It says nobody knows the hour nor the time except who the father the angels are unaware because we have the word of god that again at least gives us this promise of knowing that he's coming and guys again if you're if you're if you're out there if you're listening to me right now and you're trusting and people make a prediction how many of you have actually made predictions in your life right don't lie. Every, every, we've all probably done it at one time in our life. I'm, pre, I'm making this prediction that, you know, whatever. <laughs> Micah said the Bengals are going to win six games. He's not a prophet. <laughs> He's wrong again. And guys, again, by the way, people have been doing it, like I said, guys, for, for decades and hundreds of years, for centuries, trying to predict when Jesus was coming back. And I say all that to say this, guys, is that we know that the day is coming. And we need to be busy about the Lord's work until he comes. There are people perishing without Christ right now. There are people dying separated from Jesus for all of eternity. And yet, we have a responsibility to go and tell them. Joel 2.32, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, 
and in the remnant who the Lord shall call. Here's the greatest thing about the Word of God. Salvation is offered to all mankind. Salvation is offered to the red, the yellow, the black, and the white. Salvation is offered to the most vile of sinners, to the greatest of character people, to all those in between. That's the beautiful thing about the Word of God. It always points us to Jesus. You know what Genesis 1 does? Points us to Jesus. You know what Revelation 22 does? Points us to Jesus. The question we have to ask ourselves today, are we certain? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt? Guys, again, can I just say this, and I, and I mean this with all sincerity and with great love, and I don't mean this one bit out of a mean spirit. Eternity is not something to joke about. It's not something to, to not be serious about. It's serious business. I don't know when I'm going to breathe my, breathe my last breath, but he does. You don't know when you're going to breathe your last breath, but he does. And so you need to ask yourself if today was the last day that I took my last breath. If today was the last day that I lived on this earth, do I have a certainty of knowing that I'll spend eternity in a place called heaven? And if not, we want to give you that opportunity today. You see, again, the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here's what you have to believe, guys. You have to believe that you are a sinner separated from God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's a promise of God. That's what he's given us. And then he goes on to tell us in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. You know, what, you know what a wage is? It's something we earn. Again, when I work, guess what? I earn a wage. It's something that I work for. You know what you work for? You work for death. That's what you deserve. That's what you've earned because of your sin. But the good news is this, guys, is that in spite of that, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, separated from God, Christ died for us. He died in your place. He died for all sinners. Amen? No matter where you are in your life right now, no matter what sin you think you is controlling you and got you in bondage, guess what? Jesus Christ died for that sin. He was buried, and he rose again three days later. He's done the work for you. So you know what you have to do today is believe. You know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You will never, ever, ever do enough works to gain favor with God. The only way you can gain favor with God is through His Son, Jesus Christ. The only way for us to be reconciled to the holiness and righteousness of God is, is through his son so the question is have you have you cried out to God have you turned from your sinful ways and called on him and trusted him and him alone as your only way to heaven if not we want to give you that opportunity right now heads bowed and eyes closed I'm going to ask the praise team to make their way up front those watching by Facebook live stream this morning Listen, that challenge is for you as well. What if you died today? You know, the book of James reminds us that our life is but a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Since I've been a pastor, here's one thing again, I've, I've, I've figured out so much about life itself. Death is not a respecter of persons. And it's not a respecter of age. People have lived to be 120. People have died at birth. And all points in between. But here's another thing I do know. The Bible also says it's appointed to man once to die and after this to judgment. You see, our sin has dire consequences, as I've already mentioned. And the worst consequence it has is separation from God in a place called hell forever and ever. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, again, time to be serious.
you and God right now. He knows your heart, I don't. He knows where you are spiritually, I do not. But if you would honestly be, if you just be honest with yourself and honest before God today, and if you want me to pray for you, if you would say, Pastor Tim, I'm not saved. Pastor Tim, if I died today, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'd go to heaven or hell. Pastor Tim, I've never called upon Jesus to save me. I've never turned from my sins, and I've never trusted in Jesus and Jesus alone as my way of eternal life. Pastor Tim, would you pray for me right now? If that's you this morning, would you just slip up your hand? I want to pray for you right now. Pastor Tim, would you please pray for me? I'm not saved. Anybody in this building right now? Anyone at all? And then, child of God, maybe, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anyone else? And then, child of God, maybe God's put somebody in your heart today to just pray for. Listen, these altars will be open this morning. Maybe you're here today, and, and listen, you need to make a recommitment to God today need to rededicate yourself to the Lord today maybe you've been away from God maybe again you're just your relationship with God is not what it was a year ago or two years ago or even six months ago and you just need to come and just make a, a public declar declaration today I'm going to rededicate my life to the Lord I'm going to come and just say you know what Lord I'm just, I'm just tired I'm tired of our fellowship being broken. I'm tired of just not living the life that's pleasing to you. I'm tired, Lord, of, of just not honoring you with my life. And I want to recommit myself to you today. Recommit myself to serve. Recommit myself to give. Recommit myself to pray. Recommit myself to read your word. Or maybe here today and there's some other need that you have. In just a moment, we're going to challenge you to come going to encourage you to come as our praise team leads us in this invitation song father we come to you just humble thankful that you would even allow and call us to do what we get to do for your glory and father again as we think about prophecy as we think about every event that has already been fulfilled that was that was promised even the small events in the, in the old testament that were fulfilled quickly Father, we as children of God have so much to look forward to. And Father, what a great reminder today that all the events yet to be fulfilled will one day be fulfilled. And Father, I believe that day is sooner than we think. And so Father, help us to be ready. Help us as your children be prepared. Help us to be busy about the Father's business. Help us, God, to be bold and courageous in the world that we are living in. Father, that we would just be reminded, Lord, of the, even after salvation, there's consequences for our sin. So, Father, right now, I pray in the Holy Spirit of God, would just move in this place right now. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all this in Christ's name. Amen.